So you, let's make a start. Welcome, everybody. So tonight's theme is um, food and agriculture related as BCCF, Bedfordshire Climate Change Forum, we continue to probe the question, can Bedfordshire feed itself, which is a theme we've been sort of returning to quite a bit over the last couple of years. And tonight, as you know, we're looking at aquaponics. So we know that the challenges we face are enormous um, for in terms of food production from emissions from intensive animal agriculture to depletion of ero an erosion of soil, biodiversity loss, the issue of food miles, the sheer amount of land used for agriculture. And more recently, especially, we've been noticing water shortages as droughts become more frequent and water demand increases. And of course, obviously, there's the really big issue of, of global food security. So in local terms, we thought it would be good to address some more novel ideas about how we might address some of these issues. And aquaponics, can it offer some solutions? So an interesting fact um, I found out recently is that Kate Humble, Springwatch presenter, she has an aquaponics um, unit on her, her farm. So um, it's, um, it's something that's gaining traction over the last few years. And I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Luke Clifford is a local chef and baker and food grower. He makes really great jam and bread as well. And he's got a successful cafe over at the tennis club on Goldington Road in Bedford. So he's going to talk a little mm -hmm. bit to us, probably for about 20 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, afterwards, as I say, you can ask any questions. I mean, if you want to type your questions in the chat as we go along, because we're going to be a little bit shorter this evening, then that's absolutely fine. So feel free to put any questions in the chat as we go. OK, I'll hand over to you, Luke. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. So we're going to talk about aquaponics, or at least sort of how the system can work and help with some of the issues that were mentioned. Um, so aquaponics dates back as far back as the Aztec period, so 1000 AD. Um, we're not sure why it hasn't quite caught on yet. Um, it, it seems like a sort of no brainer. It's a very good system. Um, it uses, I don't know, 95% less water, which would obviously help with the fact that we seem to be going through droughts in the summers now. Um, we can collect rainwater through sort of the rainier periods of, of the year, autumn, winter times, and then utilize that in the system, meaning that we're not having to take water from, like as an example, Anglian water. Uh, you use a lot less space. Um, so the food in normal agriculture needs a certain amount of spacing um, in a similar, so take an acre of land, for example, you could grow the equivalent of 10 acres worth of food in an aquaponic system, um, which it, that's, that's a massive amount of food in a very, very small area. Um, it also grows twice as quickly. So not only are you taking up less space, you're producing food more quickly, more efficiently, and you're using a lot less water. Um, because everything's closer together, it, it does take a little bit more man, manpower or people rather than machinery. Though there are automated systems um, that can plant and harvest the food that you're growing, um, quite similarly to how regular agriculture is used. Um, so aquaponics is you, you're rearing fish to produce vegetables, fruit, salads. Um, it started off as sort of leafy greens. So things like lettuces, kales, um, chard and stuff like that. And people have kind of moved on to trying to grow different things. Um, obviously, there are some things that can't be grown in the system, things like wheat, barley, um, grasses mainly because they just they'd go absolutely insane in the growth they would just grow and grow and grow um, and it would just take over the entire system um, and the roots would actually end up blocking the system um, so yeah going back to the fish that you're using the f not only can you eat the fish depending on what species you use um, various different species have been used over the years 
uh, tilapia seems to be one of the most popular but in this country you'd have to heat the water um, in the winter months so we looked at using trout um, there's about four different species of trout that you can use um, for an aquaponic system which then means you've got a protein source that you can eat um, so what happens how that's utilized in the system is the waste from the fish um, it, it's poo is basically that sinks to the bottom of the water the water has a filtration system um, attached to it so the, the waste is sucked out goes through a very varied filtration system um, and goes through a process of nitrification where the waste that is produced is ammonia rich um, and that basically gets turned through to nitrites and then nitrates I mean I can go into more detail but we can leave that to the end um, and if people want to ask the questions they can I'm not going to go into too much detail of that but you basically have the filtration system and then you have the media beds or there's nutrient film technology where basically you have tubes with holes in and the little pots and the plants are grown in those and the water that comes out of the fish tank that's gone through the filtration system runs along and waters the roots and this this basically goes in a looped system so the dirty water goes through a filtration system, goes through the plants, then that goes back into the fish tanks as clean water, which is good for the fish because it takes away the ammonia from the waste from the fish and the excess food that might be there. Um, it takes away the nitrates and other various sort of things you don't really want building up in the fish tanks. Um, with the fish, you can have multiple fish tanks so you can have fish at different stages um, of growth. So you can basically have a constant harvest of fish. Um, I think it's every, depending on how many fish tanks you have, I think if you have four fish tanks, it's every three to four weeks you can harvest. But the initial, when you start the system, the initial harvest would be about eight to six, sorry, six to eight weeks. Um, depending obviously on what size fish you put in the system to start with. Um, I would probably say to start with, you want okay size, like probably three to 400 gram fish so that you've got enough waste being produced to create the nutrients for the system to work. Because obviously you need a certain amount of nitrates for a certain amount of plants. Um, so... The other good thing with this system is there's no artificial fertilizers. There's no, you don't need any pesticides, herbicides. It's completely organic, as long as you're using organic seeds, obviously. Um, but other than the fact that if you use alternative seeds to organic seeds, the whole system itself is completely organic. Um, so yeah, you don't need, you're not relying on mined or manufactured fertilizers artificial fertilizers that to be honest aren't really good for you they're also in short supply at the moment and also ridiculously expensive because most of them come from china um, which isn't really good if you're trying to do local produce it's yeah it's not good so this system would basically take all of that sort of worry away um, the only thing you really need to check regularly are the ph levels of the water um, plants need a certain pH, but they also the fish need a certain pH. And luckily, they kind of need the same pH levels to survive quite happily. With tilapia, the, the, the main difference between some of the fish is the sort of the space that the fish needs. So trout need quite a lot of space compared to, say, tilapia or catfish, or there's a couple of others as well. I mean, some have used barramundi. Um, I'm just trying to think of some other fish types, but I can have a quick look in a minute. I've got a list on my phone of all the different fish. Um, but the difference is, is obviously trout need quite a lot of space. They also need a higher oxygen level, which you can kind of you can add in oxygen <clears throat> through air pumps, air stones in the water. You can also have um, 
oh, I cannot remember the name of it. Uh, it's called a venturi, where basically what happens is in the water intake when on a pump, you have a water inlet and basically you drill a hole into the pipe and you run a like an air hose or something into that. And what happens is as the water's forced past that, you're adding in oxygen because it's sucking the air through that tube and it's mixing in with that water. So that then goes into the system. There's a really easy way of adding in oxygen into the water without actually having to pay anything to create that oxygen. You're not having to run a pump or anything. And you can have those all over the system. Um, so produce is free of pesticides. Um, so all the waste, not that there really is that much waste as in like, so obviously there's the fish waste, but then through the filtration system, you do end up with some like sludge waste that obviously you need to do something with, but that doesn't necessarily go to waste. You can either use it on regular farming. You can put it around the bases of fruit trees. It's, it's really good fertilizer. It's really high in uh, nutrients for trees, fruit trees, uh, raspberries, pretty much any kind of um, bush, any, any shrubbery, anything really, or you could put that into a bioreactor along with, I don't know, sometimes fish die in the system. It just happens. Um, any waste from the plants. So, so you're harvesting a load of salads and you're taking all the outside leaves off. All of that can go into a bioreactor that you can then create biogas. This can be used in a various different ways. You can use it in generators, um, heaters to heat greenhouses. So you've got basically from waste, you're creating free heat. Uh, you can even cook with it, to be honest. There's um, a gas, but there's a system that we looked at um, and it's called home biogas. And basically you link it up to a toilet and you can put vegetable food trimmings, pretty much anything in it, even dairy, um, high, fat fit, high fat foods, things that you wouldn't normally compost can go into this system and it creates biogas. Um, it also then creates a liquid fertilizer as a byproduct, which again can be used in regular growing systems, um, raised beds, anything. You can have it so that that naturally comes out and kind of trickles through um, into a raised bed and then grow things on top of it without even needing to do anything. So that's quite a good thing. There's, there's very little waste from the system and any waste that there is can be reused or turned into something else that's useful in the same situation. Um, so th this system can be done literally anywhere. Um, in I I've seen it on top of roofs, um, in car parks. Like when I say car parks, I mean like high rise car parks at the roof level. They've put greenhouses up there and then had um, fish tanks and all the other things that you need to run the system they've put that all in place on in a car park in a high-rise car park which I think is amazing because it also takes away some it offsets some of the carbon from the cars that are using the car park so you can then sell that produce from that area to people in their cars so they haven't they can get it go to their car and go so it's that's a really good idea um, you can also do it in warehouses, so you can do it indoors. Obviously, this would need artificial lights, um, which can be run off of solar panels, um, or you could have uh, roof lights in, put into the roof of the warehouse, so you've got natural light coming in as well. Um, I mean, one, I, I spoke to Lucy about this and using the boating lake in Bedford, um, which obviously has a massive algae problem which means that there is a lot of nutrients built up in that water. There's a lot of sludge at the bottom, probably mainly duck poo, um, but you could use that water without even putting any fish in at first, probably for a year or two. And that would actually filter out some of the rubbish that's in there. Um, and then eventually it would become deeper because you're, you're gonna pump out some of that sludge, which could then be sold off as composting 
you, you could mix that through with compost and have really, really good compost that could go to um, allotments. People could come and just pick it up. You'd like it's it's a waste product that you can use in so many different ways um but yeah we could use the boating lake you put floating greenhouses on there with a pump and maybe a few solar panels and you just have the system cycling through feed the plants and then the produce that's created from that you could then sell to the local residents around russell park um well anywhere really it could be a school a school project um so schools can be involved where they do uh trips to the to the aquaponic system uh have a little show round we can teach them how it works um they can go away with some of the produce you can also do it in schools um to an extent like it's it's a very simple system it doesn't take much to set up you need a fish tank and i mean you can use an ibc container if you don't know what they are it's it's a thousand liter water tank um and you basically you cut the top off of it flip it upside down put some growing media in it put a pump from the bottom to the top put fish in the bottom and you cycle it through and that is it is literally that simple you've got an aquaponic system you can grow it's not quite that simple you need uh, a siphon system for the water to drain in and out um but yeah it's it's there's a lot of easy ways to set this up around bedford that you don't need farmland you you could set it up in in the middle of the park you could set it up in someone's garden you can set it up in the middle of town it it really like i i thought about turning maybe uh debenhams as an example the top floor of debenhams could just be a massive aquaponics farm and then you're you've got a perfect place downstairs to sell all the produce including fish vegetables fruit i mean i've seen people grow potatoes in an aquaponics system which a few years ago people were saying that you couldn't do it um yes it's not easy and you have to use something called aeroponics which it's how do I describe that's going on to something else but aeroponics is basically you're spraying a mist of the water onto the produce permanently rather than it being submerged or buried in soil or anything like that you're just kind of spritzing the roots with high nutrient water and it and it grows and that is what aquaponics is is high nutrients constantly flowing through the roots of the plant and it grows twice as quickly and because the water is going through a massive loop there's no water loss other than through maybe a little bit of evaporation and whatever the plants absorb but like I said that can be replaced with rainwater um, so you're not having to take it from the grid. Um, another place instead of the boating lake you could do it at Priory, Priory uh, Country Park the lake there which again has a massive algae problem and this system would actually help lower the algae issue because obviously where you're taking away some of the waste that's creating the algae so the waste basically because it's high in ammonia will eventually turn into nitrates it just takes a lot longer in a water system like when it's in a lake or stagnant water technically because there's nothing it doesn't flow it only flows when it floods um but because it's high in those nitrates and nitrogen and those things that obviously help algae grow if you're taking that out and you're putting it through into a plant system and the plants taking those things out you're basically left with clear water so you're going to end up with a cleaner lake it, it to me it's a no-brainer um using that system all over the place rather than farming land that could be used for other things you can grow trees so you can offset more carbon um there's a lot of things that pe people can grow instead of monoculture on farmland that doesn't really benefit everybody it just benefits the farmers unfortunately um obviously there's a reason that they do that but i won't go into that a lot of farmers are sort of slowly turning to i think it's called container ship growing where they'll have like a hydroponic system in a container 
and obviously you can stack those up and have multiple in, in a small area you could do the same with aquaponics and then you're creating protein rich fish as well as vegetables salad fruit it's yeah it's to me it's a very good system that can be quite easily introduced it has a relatively high startup cost but so does regular farming uh, to an extent the only thing that I think is better and different with aquaponics is you don't need heavy machinery. You don't need massive tractors. You don't like the only thing you're really going to need is a forklift truck. And they run off of gas, which you could probably run off of the biogas that you're creating through the system with the waste that you of any waste you're creating. And nothing is going to landfill. Everything can be reused. Um, everything even when you're prep, prepping the fish you can make other things with the fish you can make like i, I don't know smoked trout trout pate um there's lots of different things um you can make chutneys jams um we would use mason bees or basically a pollinating bee rather than honeybees because honeybees aren't actually good for the environment to an extent of that you'd just be overrun with honeybees in four years. There'd just be too many of them. And then that, yeah, that's a whole nother story. Um, but mason bees, they don't sting. You can have them, they, they basically, they're, they're solitary bees. They just pollinate, go about the business, make the little cocoons in the ground and then go off and, and then they're, uh, larvae i suppose turn into bees and they continue the process so mason bees would be used for pollination um, within greenhouses um, you could also have wild meadows set which obviously you can do anyway but you would only need a 10 by 2 meter stretch on a three acre plot of land and that would be enough to attract enough pollinators for that entire three acres of aquaponics and three acres of aquaponics is like having 30 acres of agricultural farming land with the space that it uses. Um, so I'm just going through my points that I wrote yesterday. So my last thing is, I've touched on it a little bit, but school trips. Um, I think it's really important that we teach kids how the system works and how it can be utilised because it is the future of growing. It's the only way we can be completely self-sufficient on an island that for some reason, and I don't understand it, we basically fly all our food in. Not very much actually gets grown in the UK. It all comes from other countries. And I mean, we've got the perfect climate to grow nearly every type of food. Um, I think unfortunately supermarkets have kind of ruined that by having well as an example peppers get having peppers all year round they are ridiculously expensive but you could grow them in this country and they would be cheaper they're better for the environment because they're not flying from another country um they're fresher because they're not flying from another country and that's yeah there's a lot of benefits to aquaponics a lot of benefits i think that's pretty much yeah, I mean, I've, got, I've rambled through that quite quickly. Um, I feel like I've, I've spoken for about half an hour. You've given uh, us a fantastic overview. Thank you, Luke. I mean, you, you, you're very persuasive because you, you've talked about the, the hugely reduced water use and the hugely reduced land use, freeing up land for rewilding or, or other yeah. purposes, you know, homes indeed. You've talked about local food and the fact you're not having tractors and diesel you know maybe a forklift truck whatever we talked about um the efficiency the speed they grow i mean there must be a catch well we, we've got some questions in the chat but can i ask you first what what is the catch apart from the expensive setup why isn't this becoming really popular it's, it's really niche still isn't it i think something something i thought about a while back was i think it's similar to oil and why we still use fossil fuels and I think because people have already outlaid millions and billions of pounds on equipment and stuff they're not going to change until that equipment needs to change so people things like combine harvesters and JCB tractor they're like 
they're not cheap bits of kit. So farmers to, for farmers to just turn around and go, oh, I'm not going to use that tomorrow. I'm just going to start an aquaponic. It's a massive expense when they can still keep making money doing what they're doing now. But unfortunately, like it, like with oil and gas, it's, it needs to change. So it's that shift. It's it's that shift getting yeah. people to um, move across to something different. Um, we have we have got at least one farm farmer in the room. So I don't know if if they might ask a question later. Anyway, we'll see. But it'd be good to have some some challenge from a farmer. I just or saw a question <coughs> pop up then about Priory. Um, I don't know how to see that. Yes. About... Do, do you want to read out the question that you want to answer? Are you asking me? So I can't see it. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll read out. I'll read out the question. I, maybe I'll just start from the top because there are some good questions. Yeah, go for it. And any anyone else who wants to type anything in or raise your hand, then yeah, do feel free. There aren't too many of us, so it's absolutely fine. Um, so John Purdy said he's asking about: Is it essentially a closed loop system? He says the only put input you need would be power to run the water pumps, and perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps heat and light for the fish and plants, depending on on what you're using. So what yeah, external that, inputs that's do you That's need? entirely correct. So that it is a completely closed loop system. Okay. So the water, yeah. So the water goes basically whatever water you've got in the fish tank goes through the filtration system. That then goes into the plants. The plants take the nutrients and stuff that they need. That then goes back to a sump tank, and the sump tank is basically that that just stores the water so that the fish tanks don't overflow. Um, but that then goes, it gets pumped back into the fish tanks um, as pretty much clean water. Obviously, I wouldn't say drinking water, but it's definitely a lot better for the fish than it was if nothing was filtering it. So, as an example, priory, the the algae and stuff and the and the, the bad things that grow in that water that happens because of those things uh basically too much new too much nitrates nutrients um ammonia too much ammonia will basically poison all the fish as well to an extent so yeah uh, i've just found the questions by the way uh, Lucy, John here. I just asked a, su a supplementary question there about uh, yep. does the food for the fish come from within the system? I no, mean, so that that would be added separately, but you add that two or three times a day, um, and I mean that can be put on an automatic feeder, um, and that's just a protein-rich food, uh, basically just a fish food. So it is it is. I've had a look and there are some organic fish foods that you can purchase. Um, you could also make it yourself to an extent. Um, what what yes, sort so. of fish food is it? Forgive us. How do you mean what sort of fish food what, what's, is it? What's it made from? Uh, plants, uh, other fish, um, various different things. Hang on. I've got a one second. So I had a link to it because I was interested to find out how much it was. And that was the main reason I was looking for it. Um, so bear with me. So Aqua Organic Fish Food. Um, so the one I found, um, it's got no GMO ingredients and certified organic. Um, it also contains special ingredients formulated to nourish your aquaponic fish and your plants. Um, let me see if it says what's in it. I can probably find that. So crude protein, crude fat, crude fiber, uh, lysine, calcium, um, another type of calcium, which so they basically they have a minimum and a maximum amount of calcium in there and phosphorus. So they actually have ingredients. So organic soybean. Um, canola, uh, sweet corn or just corn, uh, linseed, uh, alfalfa, more soybean, um, okay, so I, I, I get the picture anyway, yes, yeah, so, so uh, yeah. arable crops, arable crops, basically, yeah, basically, to, to an extent, stuff, certain things that you probably wouldn't be able to grow in an aquaponic system, um. But then that's those those things. Alfalfa can be grown in an aquaponic system. 
there's a massive uh, system that's been created in America that they basically grow tons and tons and tons of alfalfa because obviously they a lot of their beef cattle eat alfalfa as yeah so they've come up with a, a relatively good way of growing it i think excellent thank you I, th I think you're muted yeah, one second. Apologies, sure. <laughs> apologies. M um, Michael's got a good question, which is related to something I was going to ask about um, the welfare of the fish, because there'll be a few people here who are vegetarians and vegans. Yep. And we'll just be wondering about the sort of the intensive living conditions of the fish. And so what, one issue is the sort of ethical, how, how what the quality yeah, obviously, of is for them. Like, like any farming, um, you can pack it full of fish or you can have it so that you've got the bare minimum for the amount of plants it depends what kind of system you want to set up whether you want it to be purely for fish or whether you want it to be more for vegetables um fruit those kind of things and i mean i would i would say i would go for less fish and more vegetables and fruit because i can utilize those ingredients better than i can utilize the fish the fish also take a lot more processing um because obviously you've got to dispatch them you've got to prep them you've got to clean up the waste from them and all of those things so i did have bear with me i'll see if i can find the stocking like limits because that is important i had it written down it's in my notes uh, and the, the related issue i suppose of the so, Sorry. Just, just as an example, you can go as little as two kilograms per cubic meter, all the way up to 80 kilograms per cubic meter, depending on obviously what you're trying to do. Um, I would probably go maybe 20 kilos per cubic meter, just so that you can guarantee that you've got enough nutrients. But bearing in mind, if you've got four different tanks, so that you're harvesting the fish more often, you can have less fish in bigger tanks because the water is always going to be circulating. It's going to have the same amount of nitrates and other nutrients in it. So the stocking densities, you can be a little bit more fish friendly, shall we say? I don't know how else to say it, but yeah, I do understand that we've got to be a little bit careful with veganism, vegetarianism. I mean, half of my family are vegetarian, a couple of them are vegan. So I get these questions quite a lot to be fair but i think you need certain parts of the parts of their waste as, as an example cows are really bad for the environment but their waste is really good for the environment because you can use it and you can use it as natural fertilizer rather than buying artificial fertilizer so i mean there's an argument for both we have we have had a previous talk on regenerative farming um, based on on inputs from cattle manure obviously um so this is sort of a similar thing but with fish isn't it um but what what so if you have very dense um you know tanks full of fish that there's going to be a higher chance of disease isn't there and then higher chance of inputs, disease there you could end up with too want. much uh too much ammonia being created which also then means you've got too much nitrates and that's actually bad for the plants because you end up burning them with nutrient like you can have nutrient deficiency you can have too much nutrients and that can actually kill the plants as well so it's that's one of the drawbacks is you've got to kind of manage the amount but you can use computer systems now that can kind of tell you how to figure out what you need to do um it'll add in so you could have a holding tank of water so basically you have the sump tank but what you could also do is have rainwater that you can add into the system to dilute the dilute the nutrients if that makes sense so if you did end up with too much you could and then if it went too low you could just add some more of that water from the sump tank back into the system and you it kind of ma, ma, no, it kind of um balances itself out yeah so like so like any farming it's finely balancing and there's there's chemistry involved isn't there yes yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, exactly that. 
Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, sort of for vegans and vegetarians, it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, but um, the, I mean, the only alternative we had that were is is um, really approved by vegans is um, the veganic farming talk we had last year that's available on our YouTube talk, and that relies on um, green manures and and the sort of um, and. I and mean, you can do some. Composting. Someone's asked the question of could you do it without fish? I mean, that's that's a hydroponic system in effect, yeah. which you could use green manures and things like vegan manures to do that. Yeah. But then to an extent, is it is that going to I don't know if that would be as easy as just using the fish as waste because you've got to measure specific amounts of specific things into that water. Um it's just going to be a little bit more labor intensive but yes you 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 definitely could go down that route and not use fish i mean you probably with priory and the boating lake you probably wouldn't need to use fish for the first year or two because there's so much and i mean there there's a lot of sludge at the bottom of those lakes there would it would take a long time for that to go through and you can create a lot of nitrogen from that waste in, term, in terms of priory, Heather asked a question about um, sort of relating to labour, I mean, and perhaps job creation as well. So if, if for example, you were having these um, projects on lakes, you'd need um, people, would they be wading out or going out by boat? I suppose it depends how... I mean, the, the, the first systems of aquaponics were literally a raft floating on the water attached to a piece of rope. So they would pull them into the side of the lake and go and get their whatever they were growing out of the lake by standing at the edge of it. But um, you could have it so that it was a jetty kind of thing that went to a greenhouse that was floating on the, on the lake. Um, the, the, my main thing with having the floating greenhouse is if there is flooding, that greenhouse will then still float on the flooding and you just have it so that it's weighted down so that if it does flood, it doesn't move. Um, but no, you wouldn't really need to wade out in the water. You could just have things that walk to it. The only issue, I suppose, would be security. Um, people getting in there and vandalising and those kind of things. But then you have that kind of problem on regular farms and they manage to deal with it. Um, That's yeah. right. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I, I keep muting myself because I'm coughing and it's, um, I'll try to remember to unmute to myself. Um, so Roz, who's a keen gardener, she says, um, just a practical thing, you mentioned about growing plants like peppers and chards yes. chard, with their roots in the water. How are they supported to be, to, to keep upright? Uh, the same way you would in a greenhouse. So with... Um... As an example, my nan at the top of her greenhouse, she's got wooden beams that go across that she's put in place and she hangs string down and she just ties those around the plant. You could do the exact same thing with peppers. Chard doesn't really need much of a support. It should grow pretty straight up. Otherwise, you've, you've not been harvesting it enough. Um, but yeah, peppers, tomatoes, um, cucumbers grow really well, growing upwards rather than just letting them trail on the floor. Um, you could put trellis in above where the plants are. Cause I mean, the, depending on what you're growing is that's going to vary what you're actually using to grow these plants. So there's lots of different systems within aquaponics. So you've got, um, flood and drain systems that you can use buckets. You can use clay pebbles in troughs. You can use, I've seen like the, the big blue barrels cut in half and filled with gravel. Um, people have used those with strawberries in and the strawberries just kind of hang over the sides and then they're harvested um, peppers grown in buckets where the water is just constantly flowing through but at a certain level and the pipes pipe goes in the top and feeds the roots from the top and then inside at the side of the bucket there's a, a tube attached and that basically the water then can kind of go in the top and out the side um, and you get a constant flow of water over those roots. Um, with something like that, you could put a cage around the whole bucket and in a similar way you would a tomato plant or pepper plants in general. Um, chili is the same. Um, I've seen people grow carrots. 
but there's to be honest from what i can see there's not a lot you can't grow there's one guy in australia that grows wasabi ginger turmeric things like that and i mean you wouldn't need much to do that here because greenhouses get that they definitely get warm enough from say like i'd say mid spring to sort of mid autumn is definitely warm enough for things like ginger wasabi um turmeric uh you can grow i don't know spring onions certain things i wouldn't grow because they will just take over um so certain types of salad maybe rocket as an example i wouldn't grow because it will just it, you just end up with a massive like it would basically go like grass you just have a complete covering of it um i've grown watercress in my system i mean i've got an aquaponic system in my garden um it's not actually in use at the moment i've basically just got the fish in the tank and it's just filtering through i'm not growing anything but it's still filtering through and the nutrients and everything is still being kept at bay and I've, they're absolutely fine i just feed them less um so, but yeah there's a lot you can grow in in terms of um heating luke so Ma mary asked <coughs> excuse yeah, me i saw that question so, yeah what would what would your be pref your preferred method of there's various heating? different things you can do i mean there's um solar heaters so i don't know it's similar to a solar panel where it's basically a black uh, how do I describe this the easiest it's basically like, like a wooden box that's got a black inside and then you have tubes running around it water goes in one end and then comes out the other end so it goes round the loops and you basically have that as a sealed box with a piece of glass or clear perspex or something and you can have that on the roof of your greenhouse and that will warm the water up enough that it won't freeze but trout are all good down to I think four degrees um and the thing is as long as the water's moving it won't freeze so the fish will be happy regardless um plant wise heating you can like I said you can use the biogas that you're creating to run heaters which you're then you're not using natural gas you're not taking fossil fuels you're creating a product from waste that you're then re-utilizing in a system so you're using the waste to heat your greenhouse. I mean, I've seen people use compost to heat their greenhouse, where you have a massive compost pile and you have a load of tubes running around the bottom of it with water in, and that then goes around your greenhouse and it heats your greenhouse up. So there, there's a few different ways you can do it. That's an, 18th, that's an 18th century technique where you use compost underneath your cold frames to keep yeah. it warm. I mean, same, there's, same if you, yeah. I mean, if you're doing it on land as well, you can use geothermal heating where you basically you have tubes in the ground at a certain depth. You pump the air from the roof of the greenhouse down into those pipes. And basically what happens is you can use it to cool in the cool it in the summer and heat it in the winter because the ground at a certain level is always the same temperature. And if you're pumping warm air, through the summer months into that ground during the winter months that ground is going to be a few degrees warmer than it would be in the greenhouse so you can then utilize that to stop your greenhouse from freezing so you can grow tomatoes through the winter i've Brilliant. seen that done that's quite a clever idea as as i can i can out julian as a local farmer julian what 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 do you think about this have you um have you well, come across this much before do you know we, any we farm next to the biggest vertical farm in Europe here um, on, on, Elms, on Elms Park. Yes. Um, they've so, got an open day tomorrow, haven't Well, they've got a... Corey can tell us later, actually. They've got a session tomorrow you can visit. Um, uh, which I, th I think is it's brilliant to have here. I, there, there's, I'm just an old-fashioned 1960s farmer, really. Um, but we're, we are trialling some organic strips and regenerative strips as well um, to see, see how we get on, because I think there's, you, you've had a much more expert um, regenerative farmer than me on um, only, a few, only a few weeks or months ago. Um, but certainly the, the pressure on input prices is making some people think. Um, I think a lot of us, I, I'm a beef farmer, um, or a serial killer, as some people look at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and um, that you know, there's so many different systems. The the low input systems. I mean, our our, our cattle are are purely grass fed, um, and maybe a bit of straw in winter. But they're an old 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 star breed, not a not modern breed. So they're very slow. Um, actually, uh, has attracted quite a lot of interest again because the, the, again the cost of concentrates, the concentrated feed, not dissimilar from your fish. Actually, I mean, you'll probably be have, feeling that pressure. On the fish food side too, except it's much smaller yeah. scale. Um, feed is very expensive by and large at the moment um, because of the war. Um, so that these old style things like um, slow growing cattle that just that they're very low low risk in the modern world because as long as you own your land, they're they're feeding off the land and they're they're re refertilizing it too. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're, we've always run a circular system here where, where we rotate our crops and we follow the crops with livestock um, and cover crops that put nitrogen back in the soil. So it's just a more complicated way of farming. I mean, the joy of 1950s, 1960s farming is it's incredibly simple um, and you can do it on a huge scale. I've, I did a tour of, sorry, I, I won't drone on but I did a tour of um, agroforestry farms around Suffolk and Cambridgeshire on agroforestry day this year. Absolutely fascinating. Most of them by their nature are organic um, because they follow similar principles. Um, and what you, what you see is it can work extremely well, but it is a hell of a lot of work. Um, and it, you, ha you have to watch out as you choose your system, and this is what that, um, that you don't replace the sides, the insecticides, the pesticides, um, and the fungicides, that you don't replace them with carbon fuel. Because actually, a lot of the work that would be done by those chemicals is done mechanically instead. Mm. Um, so you have to find your, the, the right system where you. I, I, I mean, and it is possible. I, I, walk, I was walking with one farmer across the most immaculate field of beans. And I said, I said to, and he's an organic farmer. I said to him, I've never had the courage to do this. I know my field would be a sea of thistles all the way across. Um, and he said, you know, I plant this field and I haven't set foot in it except to look at it till harvest. I mean, that it, to me is incredible. And if if that's sustainable, which I think it probably is, I mean, he's a very good farmer. Um, it's amazing. Um, and, and we've, there's, there's hope for all us traditional extensive farmers through that sort of route. Enough from me. That sounds amazing. Thanks, Julie. And the Agroforestry Day, I wish I'd known about that. We'll have to have a look out next year. Is it an annual thing? I believe so. It's quite a new thing. Uh, but in Cambridgeshire, we do have the, I think the oldest continuous agroforestry farm in the UK, um, going back uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, and th there's a lot of really good things to see, actually, Re really interesting and different, different strategies and people learning. I mean, you just keep on learning year after year after year. We've still got a long way to go. And I think the balance of, just to wrap up, I think the balance of regenerative farming, which is probably lower yielding in the end, um, and the sort of hydroponic vertical farming that we're talking about, you, it, they're naturally complementary. And uh, you know, I don't know if you've been down that amazing old tunnel network in London where they're growing vegetables, uh, quite, quite extraordinary. In, in South London, I'm, I'm miles of it. And, you know, it, if, if you, re, you can reduce your returns on extensive ordinary land farming and make up the food gap, and the food gap is the most important thing in the world, actually, um, then um, you've, you've achieved something really magnificent. Because you've got to remember that all farming is just, I mean, Grass is a solar panel and a cow is a battery in the real world yeah. because the grass turns sunlight and carbon 
into food, and that's your, into energy, stored energy, and the cow eats it, and that stores energy in a form that many animals and humans can use. Thank, thanks, Julian. I, I should at this point remind people of our veganic recording on YouTube, <laughs> which um, <laughs> I will put the link in at the end. Um, we, we had um, Ian Tolnhurst, who's quite a well-known veganic um, grower over in Oxfordshire, who was amazing. But yeah, really interesting, Julian. Thank you. And, um, you know, we need we need food security, don't we? We need resilience. And also we need food to be affordable local food locally produced we, we need to stop people to starving affordable. yeah 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 we need we need to make sure the the distribution is there locally um but yeah this this sounds really promising thanks so much luke um i don't know if anyone else has got any more questions i think, I think there was one more question on the thing about schools um ah, is yes, this Heather. something that schools could run as an educational product in the grounds absolutely Absolutely. Yeah. You, like I said, you can do this with an IBC tank and, and, and a pump and that's it. You'd need some stones and some fish and a IBC tank, which is basically just a massive water storage container. Um, there's a, there's a design called a chop and flip, which is quite a fun name. Um, but yeah, you, you cut the top off of it to a certain level and you turn it upside down. Um, you put in a drainage system that drains straight back into the pond that you've created underneath. And then, yeah, off you go. You can grow strawberries, salads. You obviously, the more of the, the more of the IBC tank you have, the more food you can produce. Um, but yeah, that can definitely be used in schools. Same way hydroponics can um, and a few other different very good growing methods. Um, Luke, just go back to this Sorry. Yeah, go on. Can I throw in one other thought, which is that pa parallel to what you're thinking about around Priory, which is there's one major greenhouse grower uh, um, who has recently completed um, a, um, uh, what's the phrase, a heat, heat pump using a river like the ooze, because you take the heat out of the river um, and, and put that into your greenhouses and then in that case, they exhaust the water back into the river, where it makes actually no real noticeable change to the environment within the river system. But it does provide free, virtually free fuel to heat the greenhouses. Yeah, that's quite cool. As in, what, using a turbine system to create energy to, to heat it? or It's, it's like, you... a, a, like, like a ground source heat pump, only it's a, a, a water source heat pump. Oh, okay, I'd it's taking the heat out of the river that, because the river flows at a, a fairly steady temperature, um, particularly at oh, the yeah, time. Yeah, it, yeah. Like if water keeps moving, it doesn't freeze, so it must stay at a specific temperature. That, that exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, that is good. Um, so yeah, go. Good sorry. to touch base after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Yeah, going back yeah. to using School. the aquaponic system without fish as well. Another way you could do it is having, I don't know, as an example, a worm farm. Because you can use worms to create compost. But what happens there is you get a byproduct of liquid, which is basically fertilizer. You could then use that um, oxygenated mixed with water um, and run that through basically like a hydroponic system. So, yes, you're going to have worms, but you're not eating or killing those worms. They just keep reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. And eventually you just move them into a new space and you can then scale that up and scale it and scale it to the point where you basically just grow using worm, worms um, to create the fertilizer from organic waste. And they will eat pretty much anything. So that would be, that would still be aquaponics because you've got- uh, moving Technically no. Or? Um, but yes, because you're using you're using a waste product from an animal in water rather than hydroponics, which is using artificial nutrients. Yeah. So in a, in a way, I suppose it's not aquaponics to the to the letter, but aquaponics to me is using a naturally occurring nu nu nutrient in water to grow vegetables. So yeah. I suppose in in some ways it is still aquaponics. Yeah. I'd have to look up the, the like specific definition of aquaponics. 
for me to answer that correctly. I, I may have just made a boo-boo and just said something wrong, but. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, it's just definitions, isn't it? It's it's really whatever whatever works. If a system works, and but if it's, it just um, I was just saying because yeah. then it keeps vegans happy, vegetarians a bit more happy because you're not having to kill fish to. But then yeah. as well, you don't have to kill the fish. Yeah, you just have let you just have less of them and let them keep growing. Yeah, it could just and eventually be like an they'll aquarium. have baby fishies too. Yeah, so. yeah, no, there are all sorts of permutations, aren't there? Which which could be. Um, yeah. which could be appropriate so yeah it sounds great thank you luke um i'm just putting in the chat um uh, a link to great big green week activities so you hopefully you you'll know about great big green week run by the climate coalition that's happening nationally and we're right in the middle of great big green week at the moment so we've got quite a few things um happening in bedford and indeed in bedfordshire but the link I've just put in the chat is about Bedford things. And one of the things um, tomorrow, very relevant to this discussion, is there's an in-farm um, visit you can do. I don't, I, Corey can tell if hopefully it's not too late to sign up. It's tomorrow, 12 till 1. Uh, Corey, are you able to um, tell us anything more about it? Um, I think it's fully booked, actually. Is it? Ah, is there another one this week? Is it just, um, just... She's actually had quite a lot of interest, um, believe it or not, because there was only 10 places per farm. Um, oh, good, good. There's two. There was one today, I think, and there's one tomorrow. Um, okay. But she is looking at doing more in future. Um, so do keep a lookout for details. Okay, that's really useful to know. Anyway, it's just down the road, as Julian said, it's Elms Farm Industrial Estate. Um, yeah, vertical farming. So with, without the fish, it's hydroponics, isn't it? Um, but yeah, quite an exciting project there to have in in Bedford. It would be I've, I don't I don't knowingly I don't know if, know if I've ever eaten hydroponically grown food. Maybe I have and I just don't know. Maybe I've they, eaten they sell through Tesco's and Waitrose and all those sort of people. So chances are you have without knowing it. Okay, maybe I have. Yeah. So thank you so much, everybody, for for coming along and um, putting up with the Eventbrite problem and for engaging and asking really good questions. It's been really good to have you. Do have a look at the Great Big Green Week events and um, share and tell your friends about it. Um, also, I should say that o October the 19th is our AGM. Um, so if you're interested in joining our committee or if you'd like to come along, please do come along. And we will have something related to agroforestry as well, because we've got the really excellent Nano Macadamia Trust um, coming to talk to us as well, because we know AGMs can be a little bit dry sometimes. So seven o'clock is the AGM business, 7.30 is Nano Macadamia Trust. So they're Bedford based um, Malawi linked. It's all about um, macadamia nut growing for soil um, health, for agroforestry, it's all um, to benefit farmers. It's about food security in Malawi. And they do a really good um, carbon mitigation certificate scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, <coughs> I will share the link. I'm losing my voice, unfortunately. So I knew my voice wouldn't last to the end of this. Anyway, so that's on October the 19th. If you're on our mailing list, you will find out about that, but we'll also share it on Facebook and Twitter as we always do. <coughs> and here's our YouTube channel, which I'm just going to put in the chat as well. So you can look at our other talks, including the veganic one that I've mentioned. But we have, we have quite a few, probably got eight or nine talks on there now. If you want to copy and paste it, it's just there. And then, of course, as I always say, I have to do a quick plug for our fundraising because we are totally self-financing and we're just volunteers. So if you feel moved to give us a few pounds to help us carry on, because we have expenses, just like things like 14 pounds a month for the Twi for the Zoom and occasional expenses on our website. And some of our speakers are professional people who we need to pay because they won't come and talk to us otherwise <laughs> so for example authors 
um, whose living is made by um, speaking and writing. They charge us, which is fine because we've had great authors as well. So if you feel moved to donate, then please do. And I think that's about it until next time. So October the 19th. And once again, thank you so much for Luke. He literally dashed from a really busy day at work. He's got a 19 month old who wants to play with him. So we really appreciate him coming and his enthusiasm. And he, I should really mention as well that um, he's got, he's setting up a crowdfunder. So he started a crowdfunder, um, but for various reasons, it, we, it didn't really get publicized and we didn't publicize it enough. And we think if it started again, it will have a really good chance. So, so look out for that and we'll certainly be sharing it because we think it's a really good project that could take off in Bedfordshire, out in Sharnbrook, where the, the plot is. And before my voice completely ends, I'll end the meeting. So thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thank nice you. talking with you all. Cheers. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I can't do this. I can't leave. <laughs> oh, you can. Uh, you should be able to. Um, uh, it's because my fa my picture's come up and it wouldn't let me. But yes, anyway. if you just close it. But before you get before you go, yeah, go do do send the crowdfunder, won't you? When I you will do. I'm back up. Basically, I haven't had a chance to get it done today. Um, yeah, no, that's I, fine. I plan to do it this evening. Yeah, um, we can do as a, a follow up. Yeah, post it can. out. But yeah, yeah, I will definitely do that. Yeah, I'll, we can uh, we I'll send can also, you the link once I've got it. Great. We could also put the link on the YouTube so people can watch the video and then have it available. Yeah, that's a great person. idea. I'll get Brilliant. that to you. Hopefully by by the end of the day tomorrow, because I get pretty much most of tomorrow off. I just okay. got to go in, go in and cook bread and then I'm with Annabelle all day. So she Is has a nap at some to? point. I'll get it done. Yeah, don't don't worry. I, I probably won't put the um, yeah, I know. It's, upload it's it to YouTube till the weekend when I have a chance. But yeah, I'm going to give it a do. longer time frame this time as well because I think last yeah. time I only gave it four weeks. I'll give it yeah. four. I'll give it eight this time. So I think yeah. that's probably a benefit. Definitely. Um, and speak to Bedford Independent again. I'm not really sure what happened there, but they said they were going to.